Well, this is week three of our Summer in the Psalms, and today we're going to look at Psalm 110. Uh, but as we look at these psalms, we want to see them as a book and see them as a book that talks about Jesus. And so particularly today, as we look at Psalm 110, we want to be uh, we want to recognize that we are reading about Jesus with Jesus here. A French priest by the name of Henri de Lubac once wrote, Jesus Christ brings about the unity of Scripture because he is the end point and the fullness of Scripture. Everything in it is related to him. In the end, he is its sole object. Now, every once in a while, even a Catholic priest speaks the truth. And uh, this particular word from this particular uh, French priest is very much on the right track. And so we want to be thinking about how the Psalms in particular, but all of Scripture, points to Jesus and highlights uh, him in his person and his work. And this is what Jesus has taught us to do. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus, talking to some of his opponents, the Jewish leaders, says, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they, Scriptures, that bear witness about me. And then after the resurrection, Jesus has a conversation with two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and we get a summary of something that then happened in Luke 24, 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then just a few verses later, Luke 24, 44, then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And so it is that Jesus has taught us to read our Old Testament Scriptures looking for Jesus, looking for the various ways that the Old Testament Scriptures point to Him and teach us about who He is and what He has done for us. One more New Testament text, uh, one more word from Jesus uh, that really highlights this important uh, topic and focuses our attention on Psalm 110. Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 to 45. This is the final week of Jesus' life. He's in the temple, and for several days, he's been having arguments with the Jewish leaders there in the temple. They've been asking him questions, trying to trap him, and trying to trip him up and expose him as a fraud. But now he turns the tables and he asks them a question. Matthew 22, picking up in verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord... How is he his son? So Jesus puts them in a corner, and they, they give no answer to this question. They affirm with Jesus that the psalm is written by David, Psalm 110 is written by David, and that it highlights another individual, the Messiah that they would anticipate, the descendant of David. But their question is, that Jesus' question to them is, if the Messiah is the descendant of David, how can David referred to his descendant as his master, his lord, someone greater in dignity, in dignity than he is. Because in their thinking, they have a certain genealogical logic that says that the ancestors are greater in dignity than the descendants. It's always that way. The father is greater than the son. And so for, G for David to refer to his future descendant way down the line from David as his Lord, his superior, how can that be? And they have no way to reconcile that in their mind. They believe that it's right that David does refer to him as his Lord. And yet it seems that these Jewish teachers, these teachers of the scriptures, had never thought about that before. And so Psalm 110, and we're going to look at this morning, is the psalm most referred to in the New Testament. Verse 1 is quoted by Jesus in the conversation we just looked at, which is repeated in both Mark's and Luke's accounts. Peter quotes verse 1 in Acts chapter 2, verses 34 and 35 in his famous Pentecost sermon. And the author of Hebrews quotes it in Hebrews 1.13. 
Verse 1 is further referred to without fully being quoted uh, 14 more times in the New Testament. Verse 4 of Psalm 110 is the special focus of the author of Hebrews. He quotes verse 4 four times and then refers to phrases from verse 4 another five times. Hebrews should probably be viewed as a sermon expounding Psalm 110 in connection with other psalms like Psalm 2 and Psalm 8 and Psalm 95. John's Gospel also seems to allude to Psalm 110 verse 4 in John chapter 12 verse 34. Charles Simeon, an English pastor from the early 1800s, observed of Psalm 110, in some of the Psalms, David speaks of himself only. In others, of himself and of the Messiah too. But in this, of the Messiah exclusively, not a word is applicable to anyone else. I affirm Charles Simeon's observation here. Uh, Psalm 110 is a prophetic psalm that focuses exclusively on the coming Messiah and his significance. So let's read Psalm 110. As we do, you might notice some connections also with Psalm 2, which Pastor Ken opened up so helpfully last week. Both Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 are royal psalms, focusing on God's anointed king. Charles Spurgeon suggested that Every word of this psalm has an infinity of meaning. If he's right, we won't be able to plumb the depths of this psalm within the hour. But we can pray with Spurgeon, May the Spirit who spoke by David give us eyes to see the hidden mysteries of this marvelous psalm. Amen. Psalm 110. A psalm of David. Yahweh says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Yahweh sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power, in holy garments, from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. So, we look at this psalm and we look at it exclusively as a prophecy about the Messiah. And that is fulfilled ultimately in the person of Jesus. And so we begin with verses 1 through 3, looking at sitting at Yahweh's right hand. Look again at verse 1. Yahweh says to my Lord. Now you see in your English Bible, the Lord says to my Lord. You read the word Lord twice in English, and that can be confusing if you don't notice the difference in capitalization. Uh, we've talked about this before, but let me just remind you that when you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your English Bible, uh, that is an indicator from your English translation that the Hebrew underneath that is the divine name, what we pronounce now as Yahweh, the name revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai that he told Moses, this is my name. I am to be remembered by this name throughout all your generations. And yet what happened ultimately is that people forgot this name. Or rather, Jews began to purposefully refuse to speak that name out loud uh, in a fear of breaking the commandment to not bear the name of Yahweh in vain. They chose to refuse to read it out loud or speak it out loud. And that developed a tradition that locked in very, very early, well before the time of the New Testament, that Jews would not speak the name of God that had been revealed to them. They would no longer say it out loud. And so when they read it in their Hebrew Bible, when they came across these four Hebrew letters that are the name of God, they would read a different Hebrew word, the Hebrew word that is the, uh, the word we normally translate as Lord or Master. And so they would read that word instead of 
the actual divine name. And that tradition set in so firmly that even when you get to uh, a couple hundred years before Jesus' time and the Old Testament Hebrew was being translated into Greek, when, they, when the translators, the Jewish translators, would come to the divine name in the Hebrew text, they would use the Greek word, kurios, which is the normal word for Lord or Master in Greek. And the New Testament follows in that tradition as well, bringing over the word, the name, Yahweh, as kurios. And so we, in English, have followed that tradition. Most languages have as well in Bible translations, and they'll bring over where the divine name is. They'll put it as the word for Lord or Master in whatever language you're translating. But they're going to indicate in some way that this is not the Hebrew word for Lord. It's actually the name of God. And so what the English Bibles have chosen to do is to change the font into a small caps font where you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And that's a clue to you, the reader, that this is the divine name. So when you read it, and, and I hope you're getting used to it by now with me, and this has just become something that has become uh, normal for me, almost natural. I don't even think about it anymore. When I see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in my Bible, my mind, I've trained myself to read Yahweh. And so when I read the scriptures, I read Yahweh there. You don't have to do that. Uh, but I encourage you to slow down enough to recognize the divine name, because here it matters a whole lot. And in many texts, it actually matters that you recognize that the divine name is being represented there. And so it takes time to slow down to recognize that here. So here, if we think we recognize Yahweh says to my Lord, then we recognize very clearly that there are two different figures being spoken of. Now, speaking about capitalization issues, when David writes, Yahweh says to my Lord, most of our English Bibles have a capital L there at the beginning of that title. Not all of them, but most of them. My Lord. Some of them, the 2011 edition of the NIV being one of them, has a lowercase l, my Lord. What most of our Bible translations are doing is recognizing the reality that the Lord here, my Lord, is a reference ultimately to Jesus. And so they capitalize that to kind of prejudice you as a reader or bias you to recognize that connection a little bit more clearly. But I believe that is a mistake, because what, what happens is we, we read capital L-O-R-D, and we automatically think, well, this is the lordship of Jesus being referred to, meaning his divinity, that he is God, the Lord, that he is equal with the Lord God. And so the capital letter pushes us to think about Jesus in his divinity, Jesus as God. But that's actually not the focus of this psalm. This psalm is about Jesus' humanity. It's about his humanity. That becomes a very important point to recognize as we go through the psalm. David is speaking of his future human descendants. I don't know whether we could say for sure that David recognizes that the, his descendant, that's going to be the Messiah, is going to be God. He is God, as it turns out, but I don't know that David recognizes that. But here, you get very close to that. Yahweh is taking this human descendant of David and is going to enthrone him right next to him on his right to share the throne of God in heaven. So certainly this figure is being exalted to the highest place, but it is as a man. And that's actually very important to understand about Jesus. Jesus' exaltation to the, right, to the throne, to the right hand of God, is not about his divinity. It's about his humanity. He is being exalted as the human king, the Messiah, who is a human figure. Now, he's also fully God. The scriptures become very clear about that. But this text is about his humanity. So I would support the 2011 edition of the NIV, which has a lowercase l here, and then just making the connection very clear that he is talking about Jesus, but Jesus as a man. You can't separate those two things, and I understand that. But I hope you get my point here. We're talking about the human role of Jesus as the Messiah uh, and not his divinity. And I'll show you why that's important as we go through. But here, what we see in verse 1 is ultimately about Jesus' ascension and exaltation. Jesus' ascension and exaltation. If we ask the question, when is this prophetic oracle, this prophetic message, fulfilled? When did it happen? When does it happen? 
And it happens, according to the New Testament writers who quote verse 1, it happens when Jesus rises from the dead and then ascends to heaven. So he spends 40 days in his resurrected body on earth, hanging out with the disciples, teaching them and talking with them and spending time with them. And then after 40 days, he ascends to heaven. Where does he go? He ascends to the right hand of God. He sits down on the throne at the right hand of God, according to this passage. And the New Testament writers go here to Psalm 110.1 to prove that that is biblically what happened. Because with their own eyeballs, they didn't see that reality, right? They saw him go up, but they didn't see where he ended up. But they understand Psalm 110.1 to teach them that this is what is happening in that moment. So Jesus is ascending to heaven. He sits down at the right hand. But notice the way Psalm 110.1 says this. Sit at my right hand for a certain period of time until I, Yahweh, God, make your enemies your footstool. So... He says, you're going to sit down at my right hand, share my throne in heaven, and rule from there. You're going to reign from this throne for a certain period of time until I make your enemies your footstool. And so what Psalm 110.1 announces is that there's going to be this period of time where Jesus, where the Messiah, is reigning from heaven until the end point of that is when God makes all of his enemies his footstool. Now to make this clear, the Apostle Paul quotes Psalm 110.1, but he doesn't say, sit at my right hand. He uses a different word when he quotes the verse. He explains the imagery. What does it mean for Jesus, the Messiah, to sit at the right hand of God in heaven? What does it mean? What is happening when Jesus is sitting at the right hand? 1 Corinthians 15.25 for he, that is Jesus, must reign until he has put, until he, that is God, has put all his enemies, the Messiah's enemies, under his, the Messiah's, feet. So Paul explains sitting at the right hand of God as reigning. So what is Jesus doing right now? He is reigning. He is ruling. So Paul understands Jesus is sitting at the God's right hand from Psalm 110.1 as his reigning. And that leads us into verse 2, Psalm 110, verse 2, where we read about Jesus' present reign. Verse 2. Yahweh sends forth from Zion, that's God's heavenly home, your mighty scepter the kings, David's lords, the Messiah's mighty scepter, saying, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Now, it is sometimes said that the Old Testament doesn't speak of the church age or of the church as God's people. That is false. Verses 1 and 2 quite specifically and clearly speak of the church age. And I believe verse 3 describes the church, though admittedly verse 3 is less clear. We'll look at that in just a moment. The Messianic kingdom doesn't begin with the future millennium. The Messianic kingdom began with Jesus' enthronement following his resurrection. He spent his ministry announcing the imminent arrival of the kingdom and inviting sinful people to enter that kingdom by trusting in him and following him as the king. But the New Testament is clear that he took his throne, he was exalted to his rightful position as king at the right hand of God after he walked the path of suffering and death on a cross and resurrection from the realm of the dead. So in verse 2, David's Lord, the Messiah, is commanded to rule in the midst of your enemies. What does this command mean? And how does Jesus do it? First, we should note that the word rule is a unique word in the Old Testament. It first appears, translated as exercise dominion, in the command to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.28. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Thus, Adam and Eve together, humanity, were commanded given the responsibility to rule as royalty, God's vice regents, exercising dominion over the rest of non-human creation. 
But the word also appears in a messianic prophecy from the pagan prophet Balaam, or Balaam, if you're used to saying it that way. Numbers 24, 19. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion, same word, and destroy the survivors of cities. Exercise dominion would reflect the positive, saving aspect of the future king's reign, while destroying the survivors would describe the negative, judging aspect of the future king's reign as he punishes those who remain in rebellion against him. Notice in Psalm 110, too, that he is instructed to rule in the midst of his enemies. This must refer to what we call the church age, the period of time since Jesus sat down at the right hand of God and until, as verse 1 said, God puts his enemies down finally, defeated and set as his footstool. So Jesus is currently, right now, ruling in the midst of his enemies. He's not judging or destroying them. They continue in their rebellion even as Jesus is ruling. Thus, Jesus' current rule is contested from the human vantage point. But this exercising dominion, this ruling, is fulfilling the role of humanity given to Adam and Eve in the creation mandate that we looked at a moment ago. And this ruling is fulfilling the messianic prophecy of Balaam as well. But what does this ruling look like in reality? Well, it looks like the recruitment of volunteers. Jesus, the king, from the heavenly throne, enlists soldiers into his holy army. He recruits his enemies to become his friends, his allies. This is what verse 3 poetically and somewhat cryptically describes. Verse 3 describes Jesus' holy army. Verse 3 is very difficult to translate into English. There's no verb in Hebrew. Essentially, you have a chain of four or five phrases. If the person being described is the Messiah, then your people refers to the Messiah's people, which would be a reference to the church. The first phrase describes the church as, literally, free will offerings as in the sacrificial system, suggesting that the king's army is made up of people who have volunteered their lives in service to him. This sacrificial imagery probably sits in the background of Paul's instruction to us in Romans 12.1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So, as the Messiah is ruling in the midst of his enemies, he is recruiting volunteers to his cause. Volunteers who change their clothes from rebel colors to the holy splendor of the Messiah's army. On the day of your power, as the ESV has it, could refer to the power the Messiah exercises in transforming these volunteers from rebels into loyal soldiers. He exercises his power to save sinners. The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, according to Paul, that's the gospel message. So here we may have a poetic description of the Messiah's great work of conversion during this church age. He is reigning from his throne in heaven at the right hand of God by exercising his power in this world through the Spirit's application of the gospel message to sinful people's hearts. We are awakened to new life, changed from rebels into saints, born again to new life. The final two phrases in the verse are the most cryptic. The ESV even has a footnote on the last phrase that says, the meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain. I think Charles Spurgeon was probably on the right track when he said, Let but the gospel be preached with divine unction, and the chosen of the Lord respond to it like troops in the day of the mustering of armies. They come arrayed by grace in shining uniforms of holiness, and for number, freshness, beauty, and purity, they are as the dew drops which come mysteriously from the morning's womb. That's all we can really say about verse 3. So let's press on into verses 4 through 7. The second section is headed by another oracle, or this time an oath. An oath about 
unique priesthood, the key to the king's certain victory, a unique priesthood. So verse 4 introduces us to this oath. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So here we have to talk about making much of Melchizedek. We have to go back to Genesis chapter 14 here. Genesis 14 tells the story of warfare between several ancient cities, including Sodom and Gomorrah. Verses 1 through 12 summarize these conflicts, but then focuses in on the defeat of Sodom and Gomorrah because Lot, Abram's nephew, was taken prisoner. So in verses 13 to 17, we read about Abram leading a contingent of trained soldiers into battle and rescuing Lot and the other prisoners and soundly defeating the armies of those other cities. Then if you skip verses 18 to 20 for a moment, the king of Sodom seeks to reward Abram for rescuing his people, but Abram refuses to accept a monetary reward. The story reads quite coherently and simply without verses 18 to 20 which tells about Melchizedek. The same is true in Psalm 110. If we skip verse 4 of Psalm 110, verses 5 through 7 re flow really well as describing the victory of the enthroned king from verses 1 to 3. So what's up with Melchizedek? He's introduced in verse 18 as king of Salem. Salem was not a city involved in the conflicts we had just read about. Melchizedek is king of Salem, which later would become better known as Jerusalem. Melchizedek is also priest of God Most High, whom Abram equates with Yahweh. Melchizedek blesses Abram and praises Yahweh, and then Abram gives Melchizedek a tenth of the spoils Abram took in battle. Then Melchizedek disappears from the story, never to be mentioned again until David refers to him in this psalm. Now, let me just pause here very briefly and tell you to buckle your theological seatbelts. We're about to tread some deep water here, okay? So hold on, track with me as best you can, and plan to come back to this and reread and reread and rethink through some of Genesis 14 and the book of Hebrews as we kind of dive in and give some summary comments of some very difficult topics. Okay? So, seatbelts fastened. Let's plow forward. So, what's going on here? Apparently, David has been reading his Bible when he writes Psalm 110. He's been reading Genesis, and the strange story stands out to him. He recognizes Melchizedek as a royal priest, a single person serving as both a king and a priest at the same time. This arrangement is not the way it was done in Israel. The Mosaic law kept the office of priest separate from the office of king. The Mosaic law specified that the office of priesthood would pass from generation to generation of descendants of Aaron from the tribe of Levi. Prophecy in the book of Genesis established the royal family as coming from the tribe of Judah. Genesis chapter 49. So what has David noticed in Genesis that makes Melchizedek an important figure, typologically prophetic of a future descendant of David's who would serve as both king and priest. How did he recognize it? We could simply say that the Spirit revealed that connection to him, and that's probably the, the final answer at the end of the day. But most of the time, if not always, the Spirit's revelation within Scripture was progressive. That is to say that the Spirit showed prophets new things that were rooted in earlier Scripture. They weren't brand new ideas out of, born out of whole cloth. They were built on what the Spirit had revealed earlier on in the script, earlier Scripture. Here's what I think the Spirit led David to notice. Melchizedek is actually not the first of his kind. He's not the first person in the Bible to serve as a king and a priest. In verses 1 to 3, we notice the connection back to Adam and God's commission for humanity to exercise dominion over the rest of creation in Genesis 1 to serve as God's vice regents, both Adam and Eve together, his royal rulers over this world. Well, as it turns out, Genesis 2 uses language that indicates that Adam was also supposed to serve as priest. 
in God's creation. Genesis 2.15 says that God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The pair of words translated work and keep are used together several times in the book of Numbers to describe and explain the priest's service in relation to the tabernacle. David may have recognized this connection, showing that Adam's responsibility was characterized as a priestly task. So if David saw Adam as the original royal priest who failed in his roles and then noticed the appearance of Melchizedek, one who is greater even than Abraham, David's ancestor, he may have been able to draw these threads together in Psalm 110, as the Spirit indicated to and through David that his future descendant, the Messiah, would be a royal priest who would succeed in his rule and successfully serve as priest for his people. The author of Hebrews seems to make this connection and develop it even further as he applies both Psalm 8, which reflects on God's original intention for humanity to rule over creation, and Psalm 110 to Jesus. By doing this, Hebrews specifies what Paul means when he refers to Jesus as the last Adam. He is a royal priest who does what Adam failed to do. The book of Hebrews makes much of Melchizedek as well, famously, showing how Jesus is... Jesus the king, God's son, fulfilled the priestly role set up by Melchizedek's sudden appearance in Genesis. Hebrews lays out how Jesus is greater than angels, greater than Moses, greater than Joshua, and that's just the first four chapters. At the conclusion of chapter 4, the author begins to show how Jesus is greater than Aaron also. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Then in chapter 5, the author begins to substantiate the nature of Jesus' priesthood from Scripture. Why and how is Jesus' priesthood greater than Aaron's? The oath sworn by God appointing his son as priest in the order of Melchizedek, as revealed in Psalm 110.4, is the reason. After commenting on his readers' dullness and laziness as a reason that they might not be able to understand what he's talking about, and then warning them sternly about the danger of remaining in that dull and lazy state, he returns to explain Jesus' connection to Melchizedek in chapter 7. He makes several points from Genesis 14, verses 18 to 20. Melchizedek's Hebrew name means king of righteousness. His title, king of Salem, means king of peace. So the message of his name and his title is that there would be a king who would achieve and preserve righteousness and peace together. Then the author pays close attention to the oddity of Melchizedek's appearance in Genesis. In the book of Genesis, anybody who's anybody gets a genealogy. Genesis is a strong, family-oriented book. If a character in the story is important, typically that person's ancestors or descendants will likely be listed somewhere. But not Melchizedek. He appears and in two verses is gone from the story. Then the author of Hebrews highlights how he's greater than Abraham because Abraham paid him a tenth of the spoils of battle. Why did Abraham do this? Presumably to honor this king who was greater than him. If he's greater than Abraham, then he's also greater than Levi, Abraham's descendant. That's some genealogical logic common in the ancient world. Along the way, the author notes that Melchizedek's story doesn't include an account of his birth or his death, which should remind us of the eternal Son of God and set the stage for a priesthood that wouldn't end in death. He returns to that very point by giving the contrast, highlighting the inferiority of the priesthood of the Mosaic Covenant. Aaron died. Aaron's sons died. All of Aaron's priestly descendants would die and have to be replaced as long as the Mosaic Covenant remained in force for God's people. Then he returns to Psalm 110.4. Descent would not govern the Messiah's priesthood. Instead, 
God's own oath decrees him to be a priest. And this is seen to be a greater ordination than the ordination laid out in the Mosaic Law for Aaron's descendants. And it's the oath of God which sets the stage for the Messiah's priesthood to serve as the mediator of a better covenant than the Mosaic Covenant. The author's conclusion goes like this in Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest one who is seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. And then in verse 6, he adds, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. Ultimately, what we see in Psalm 110.4 is an indicator. Right in the middle of the psalm, of the way the enthroned king has won victory over his enemies through his unique priesthood. The union of kingship and priesthood in Jesus is at the very center of the Christian faith. The victory won through the priestly act of sacrifice. The author of Hebrews explains like this in Hebrews 9, 11 to 14. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Earlier in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, the author connected Jesus' self-sacrifice to his victory over his enemy, the devil. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Now, let's return to Psalm 110 and see how David sketches out this victory. Victory on Judgment Day. So if verses 1 to 3 focus in on the church age and describe the church and Jesus' accomplishment as the king, his enthronement and the way that he rules in this world, verses 4 through 7 go back to his pivotal act of priestly sacrifice and then the outcome of that, jumping over the church age and looking at the final ultimate outcome of his great priestly work, is Judgment Day and how that unfolds. Verses 5 and 6. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. The smashing of kings, this day of wrath, this judgment of nations, filling them with corpses. To what does this refer? Well, it refers to what we read about in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. I'll leave that for you to go and read. Pastor Ken read a portion of that passage last Sunday in his message. And so you can, perhaps it's fresh on your mind, but you can go and look at it. That's what's being announced here in these verses. That's the fulfillment of this prophecy is what will happen in Revelation 19, verses 11 to 21. To quote Spurgeon again, The last verses of this psalm we understand to refer to the future victories of the priest king. He shall not forever sit in waiting posture, but shall come into the fight to end the weary war by his own victorious presence. He will lead the final charge in person. His own right hand and his holy arm shall get unto him the victory. Now there's a couple of things we have to pay attention to here to understand what David has given us. First, in verse 5, that first line, the Lord is at your right hand. We have to ask the question, who is the Lord here? And so what we have to see is that you've got, if you're just reading your English Bible, you've got three references to the Lord. And they're actually, you've got more than that, but you've got three different Hebrew words reflected in the psalm for Lord. You've got Yahweh in verse 1 and in other places as well. Yahweh representing the divine name. 
But then in verse 1, you've also got the reference to my Lord. And my Lord is the Hebrew word, listen very carefully, and you'll see this on the screen as well, Adoni. Adoni. Adoni is always used in the scriptures for a human, or at least a reference to not God. There's a couple of places where it refers to an angel. But my Lord, Adoni, always refers to a, a superior human in the Old Testament, or a, a superior who is not God. Because again, a couple of times it refers to an angel. But here in verse 5, the word that's translated exactly the same way, it's the same word, but it's spelled slightly different, differently. Again, you can see this on the screen probably, but uh, Adonai. Adonai. That is the Hebrew word that is referring to God as sovereign, Lord. Master. So when you see the word Lord, most of the time, with a capital L in the Old Testament, most of the time, it is Adonai, which refers to the Lord as a title, master, owner, superior, sovereign. And that's probably what's going on here. Adonai is Yahweh who is ensuring the king's victory by his wrath. And so Adonai is... God. God is at the king's right hand. And so earlier in verse 1, the king was commanded to sit at the right hand of God, the right hand of Yahweh. But here, this is describing the Lord, Yahweh, God, coming alongside, coming to the right side of the king when he goes into battle. So while the king, so while Jesus is sitting on his throne, he's at the right hand of God. But when Jesus returns to this earth to go to battle against his enemies, God will come alongside him. Yahweh, the Father, will come alongside him at his right hand to support him and to en enable him to win the ultimate victory by exercising God's wrath, by executing God's wrath in judgment against his enemies. Now, this, these verses also give us a unique picture of the bigger picture of that victory. Head crushing, head crushing is the ultimate victory. This is obscured in our English Bibles here. But notice verse 6. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. The ESV says, he will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. You might see a footnote there if you're reading the ESV, or in most English Bibles you'll see a footnote. Literally, it is he will shatter or crush a head a head over the wide earth. Now what this does is set up a contrast between verse 6 and verse 7. So the king is being depicted here as crushing a head of his enemies, and then at the end of verse 7 he is lifting up a head, his own head, lifting up his head in victory. And so you get a contrast of heads there, but head crushing is actually a major theme in the scriptures. And so this, pro this prophecy is picking up this major theme that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in the very first prophecy, that's a plain future tense prediction of the Messiah's victory as the descendant of Eve is announced to come to crush the head of the serpent. Genesis 3.15, God is speaking to the serpent after the rebellion of Adam and Eve, and he's issuing a curse on the serpent. I will put enmity, hostility, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He, a singular male descendant of Eve, a human, a man, shall bruise your head, crush it, and you shall bruise his heel. Now the image there, if you visualize what's going on, is... A human being, a man, coming and stepping on the head of a snake. And while he steps on the head of the snake, the snake bites him. And the imagery there is of a poisonous snake. It's not just some garden grass snake that can't hurt you. It is a poisonous snake, a viper, that would bite the man and kill him. This is in Genesis 3.15 is announcing a victory over the serpent that involves the death of the victor of the conqueror. And of course, we know how that gets played out in Jesus' death on the cross. Jesus died on the cross as a victim of Satan's evil work. But in dying, he defeated, destroyed the devil, 
is what Hebrews told us back in Hebrews 2. This prophecy is picked up repeatedly in the Old Testament. It's a major theme, actually, the crushing of the head of enemies. And it's all going back to Genesis 3 and then showing in various prophetic ways that there's coming an ultimate day where the final serpent, the one who empowered the serpent in Genesis 3, Satan himself, would be crushed finally and decisively. A prophecy that's important in this regard is Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. You've already alluded to Numbers 24, 19, which is Balaam, or Balaam, the pagan prophet. Two verses before that one that we mentioned earlier says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. That imagery, again, is reflecting back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and it's pointing forward to the coming of this descendant of Israel, this descendant of Jacob, this Jewish man, who would ultimately come and crush the heads of all of the enemies of God's people and the enemies of God. Moab and the sons of Sheth become the historical picture of uh, those great enemies. But remember how this, this story tracks through the Old Testament. Remember how J.L., crushed the head of Sisera in Judges, or when an unnamed woman crushed the head of Abimelech in Judges 9, or David, didn't he sink his stone into the forehead of the giant Goliath before chopping off his head with a sword? The anticipation in verse 1 of Psalm 110 is that the Messiah's enemies would be under his feet as a footstool, and that connects with this reference to the crushing of heads all over the world, Satan and all his followers are crushed under the foot of Jesus, even as Jesus was killed in the blow Satan and his followers landed on the cross. The bruising of Jesus' heel, depicted as a poisonous snake bite in Genesis 3.15, resulted in his death. But his death resulted in the crushing of Satan's head. Jesus won the great victory by offering himself as a sacrifice on the cross. His priestly work turned out to be the key to his royal victory. But Psalm 110 verses 5 and 6 here points forward to the consummation of that victory. The final putting down of rebellion against God. The kings and nations and all their followers from Psalm 2 raging and rebelling against God and his anointed one will be subdued, condemned, and punished eternally. Now as we come to verse 7, we see a picture of refreshment following victory. He will drink from the, brook, from the brook by the way. That's just a picture of what a human king would do after the, the, after the war is over and after he's won. He would drink from the brook in enemy territory, probably, and he would be able to lift up his head not uh, lower his head in shame because he's been defeated, but lift up his head in great pride because of his great victory. He will lift up his head. Now as we conclude, let's consider what it means to live in light of the royal priest's victory. The great war has been won. To use the well-worn analogy of World War II, in the great cosmic war between God and Satan, D-Day was achieved when Jesus invaded the enemy territory of this fallen world, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended to heaven to sit on his throne, having won the decisive victory over Satan, sin, and death. As what historians recognize as the final victory in World War II, V.E. Day, occurred almost a full year later, so in the great cosmic war between God and Satan, V.E. Day is scheduled for the day Jesus returns to bring final judgment against all who remain in rebellion against him. What, we look, what, you, what you would see in Revelation chapter 19. As there was further fighting between D-Day and V.E. Day in World War II, so we are living in the days of ongoing warfare even though the victory has been certainly secured. Jesus has been reigning from his throne in heaven, enlisting volunteers for his army. If you're a follower of Jesus today, you've been enlisted. 
How should we live in light of the royal priest's victory? Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Is that your great aim? Are you living to please the one who enlisted you, even in the midst of suffering and opposition? How are you engaging in the battles? Are you waging warfare according to the flesh? Or are you putting the deeds of the flesh to death? As Paul instructs in Romans 8.13. What are the weapons of our warfare? How should we be fighting? The king has won the victory through his priestly work of self-sacrifice. The gospel is the announcement of that great work. And the gospel is the truth we cling to. The power we depend on and the source of an endless supply of grace that God continues to extend to us. Jesus exercises his total and complete authority on earth through the mission of the church, as presented in the Great Commission. He exercises His total and complete authority through us as we proclaim the gospel, as we reach outward throughout our world to make disciples from all the nations, baptizing those who respond with faith and repentance and instructing those who respond to obey everything Jesus teaches in God's Word. A fellow by the name of Daniel Estes writes, the author of Hebrews reminds us that we have great hope as the people of God because we serve the one who endured the cross, scorned its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And as we consider him our priest and king, we will not grow weary and lose heart. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3. On the contrary, we will be emboldened by our conviction that since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Hebrews 12, 28. Yes and amen. Martin Luther wrote a full 123 pages on Psalm 110. Luther's concluding paragraph is worth quoting in full, and then we'll be done. Luther wrote, This beautiful psalm, therefore, is the very core and quintessence of the whole Scripture. No other psalm prophesies as abundantly and completely about Christ. It portrays the Lord and His entire kingdom and is full of comfort for Christians. For He is a lovable, comforting king and priest, for those poor, miserable, suffering, and plagued Christians on earth. Terrible, however, will he appear to those who neither accept him nor believe in him. But this is also for our benefit and comfort, so that we may not be afraid of those who are his enemies. Therefore, let him be our dear king and priest, who represents us before God forever. His enemies... Whatever their names may be, however smart, wise, and mighty they may be, he will find them in due time, smash and uproot them, and cast them into the abyss of hell to be eternally damned. May God help us to remain loyal to this Lord, to remain grateful to him, and to sing this psalm to him with true faith and joy. To him, our dear Lord and Savior, be all praise and honor, together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God through all eternity. Amen. Some questions to consider as we close. As Jesus asked the Pharisees, I ask you now, what do you think of the Christ? What do you think about Jesus? Do you know Him as God's Son? Do you know Him as your great High Priest? Do you know Him as your King? Have you offered yourself freely to join His army? Have you laid down your life as a living sacrifice? Are you enjoying the freedom that his priestly self-sacrifice has won for you? Would you pray with me? Father, thanks for this great psalm that does present so much glorious truth to us about our great Savior. Thank you for installing him as our king. There is no other king who compares to him. There is no idea of kingship in this world that humans have come up with that compares with the way he exercises his kingship over us. Thank you for the rule, the lordship, the mastery of Jesus over the lives of his people. Would you help us to submit to him freely? 
to enjoy the freedom that he provides to us as his followers, as his soldiers. Would you equip us by your spirit, Lord, to fight the good fight, to carry on walking by faith, and not by sight. Help us to wage the good warfare. Help us to stand firm against the heavenly rulers and authorities that bring so much chaos and sin and brokenness into this world. Lord Jesus, we pray to you as our great King. We thank you that you have won the great victory over all our enemies. And we pray, Lord Jesus, return soon. Bring all of this history of brokenness and sin and death to an end. And then let us rejoice with you as you turn the kingdom over to your Father, to our Father, to our great God, to whom all glory belongs forever and ever. Amen.